Now on Scottish, the Liberal Democrats Party Conference Report. If the pundits and if the people want an answer to the question as to whom I should most want to work with in a Scottish Parliament, it is simple and it is this. It is more Liberal Democrats and the more the better. MP Jim Wallace, leader of Scotland's eternal political optimists, the Liberal Democrats, who spent the past few days at their annual conference in Inverness trying to convince the public and themselves that they can seize power in a Scottish Parliament without outside help. Well, an opinion poll today on the forthcoming elections told a different story, but more of that in a moment. In a conference that, despite the traditional cheerfulness of the Lib Dems, was low-key and sparsely attended, that longed-for new institution at Holyrood figured in almost every debate. And on the first day, Deputy Leader Alan Beath did his best to rouse the enthusiasm of the faithful few. Politically, Scotland is now an exciting place to be. The decision of the Scottish people to restore a Scottish Parliament has opened the door to a modern, cooperative style of politics. While Westminster's Parliament remains a museum of all that is worst in parliamentary practice, time-wasting, name-calling and confrontation, Edinburgh's Parliament can break new ground. Indeed, it will have to. Fair voting by proportional representation means no more one-party politics. And the main debate this morning was on the aims, range and restrictions of the Scottish Parliament. Critical of the government's decision to plump for Holyrood, the motion before the floor asked that all further decisions of public interest relating to the Parliament should be opened up to full public consultation and urged that the Scotland Bill be amended to remove from the list of powers reserved for Westminster those which have traditionally been in the hands of the Scottish office. The glass is already coming off the referendum consensus, and Labour seem determined to plough their own furrow on the Scotland Bill. Take the Blairite spin doctors at the Labour conference who were suggesting that a parish council is all we deserve and a parish council is all we're going to get. Colleagues, I fundamentally disagree with that patronising assertion and we must make sure that it's not a parish council we get, but a powerhouse parliament as laid down in the Scottish Constitutional Convention document. We're talking about an evolving institution, one that's going to develop over time, not one set in tablets of Aberdeen granite. And we'd therefore be far more sensible to put off this whole business of designing and building a new building in advance of the parliament and leave it to the members of parliament, cross-party discussion, exactly as happens at Westminster. How much more credit the Secretary of State would have got if he had said, after cross-party consultation, we are going to catch up with a backlog in school building maintenance before we build a Scottish Parliament building. <laughs> the Parliament is going to start with no traditions, therefore let it start with some ideals. It's going to start in an atmosphere talking about the glories and history of Scotland and that's fine. But yet our major cities contain some of the grimiest and dampest crime and drug-ridden, poverty-gripped housing estates in Europe. And the Parliament must concentrate on these issues and provide a ray of hope to those in our country who've given up hope. Well, according to that new Mori poll, the Liberal Democrats are trailing far behind Labour and SNP in voting intentions for the Scottish Parliament at 9% with the Tories, to Labour's 42 and the Nationalists 36%. So will they go a wooing? And who will the prospective marriage partner be? Bernard Ponsonby reports. 
With the general election behind them, the Liberal Democrats are looking ahead to next year's elections to the Scottish Parliament. The new proportional electoral system will mean that no one party will have an overall majority, raising the questions, who will the party deal with and on what terms? We will be policy driven, not power driven. Um, we don't want to share power with anybody just for the sake of it. If we do go into an agreement in government with any other political party, it will be because that party can implement some of our manifesto commitments that are dear to our heart. If that doesn't happen, then we're not really interested in any kind of uh, arrangement, partnership arrangement. The party's Treasury spokesman, Malcolm Bruce, fired an early warning in the coalition debate, ruling out cooperation with the SNP if they insisted in trying to engineer an independence referendum early in the life of the new parliament. It's totally unacceptable, not just to us, but to the people of Scotland. What they are basically are saying is, we don't accept your verdict, we're not even prepared to give it a try, we don't want it to work, we're advertising our intention not to make it work, and they don't really deserve to be involved in government if that's their intention, they're just wreckers. Others are more pragmatic, arguing if the SNP put aside the independence question, then cooperation should be possible on policy areas. They dropped that and actually looked at a realistic programme for the Scottish Parliament, uh, which would result in us being able to implement some of our priorities on education and health and fighting crime. Then I think we would be able to work with the SNP on that basis. But it would obviously have to look at the agenda that they bring forward after the election. At a future date, the party will have to resolve whether or not it favours a formal coalition, where it would have seats in a future Scottish Cabinet, or whether it will support a minority government on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. Well, I think the first thing that the Liberal Democrats have to say is that you know, we are driven by the, the policies and good government. We are not driven by power. So therefore, it's important to say that we may not be working directly and closely and in, you know, joined together with any other party. In the run-up to the Scottish parliamentary elections, the Liberal Democrats will talk much about their independence. This weekend, they have been giving the impression of being prepared to deal with anyone, although in private, senior sources are saying they are most likely to deal with Labour. A Liberal Democrat Labour coalition remains the most likely outcome of next year's elections. We'll be raising that with Jim Wallace in a moment. Probably the most contentious issue of the three days at Eden Court Theatre was never debated in public, and that was party policy on gender balance at the Holyrood Parliament. The leadership had tried to introduce a proposal to guarantee women places at the top of the candidates list. Aileen Clark followed the saga as it raged behind closed doors. Behind every successful political party is an army of dedicated women ready to don the party colours and keep the show on the road. But in the coffee bars and bars in Inverness this week, the topic of much debate was whether the Lib Dems should give women a helping hand to make sure more can shed their supporting role and head for the spotlight of a Scottish Parliament by being pushed further up the top-up lists. At the moment, we, we only have two women in, in the constituency seats and a, and a whole load of, of, of males. Um, if the constituency seats had chosen more women, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't need, need to intervene at all. But you know, if you have an inbuilt in bias against women, you have to somehow correct that. There were real objections that the leadership was even considering this route in the light of recent developments. The real issue has always, for me, been the deal with Labour. We had to deliver on a deal that we did with Labour. We were honour-bound by it. Well, Labour have ripped up that agreement on two counts. They've reduced the number of MPs. They've not amended the Sex Discrimination Act. Both things they could have done. That deal's gone. We are no longer honour-bound. So the party is free to decide on its principles what it wants to do. And basically, the party was never happy with positive discrimination. And that was definitely echoed at this men-only table in Eden Court's restaurant. I would be delighted to see more women uh, representing the Lib Dems in the Scottish Parliament or any other parliament uh, or, or council, but I believe a candidate is a candidate is a candidate. And from women too, much doubt and some reluctant support. My view is that in this one particular unique set of circumstances, I would say this was the way to go. I think we're in a situation where there is no right answer, and this is the one that would achieve the best end result. 
The motion was withdrawn. Stephen Gallagher, one of its backers, explained to a Weedy Press Corps why. I think it was very difficult for us. Uh, the motion which emerged from our conference committee was different to the one which was submitted, and it was difficult to get a consensus around what we should debate. Now, the reason underlying that is this is a very sensitive issue. It's one which arises great passions, which are central to liberal democracy, and some people are very uncomfortable with positive discrimination and taking risks with legalities. A clearly disappointed Madeleine McLaren tried to salvage some hope that women would win selection on merit alone. Well, I feel a little uneasy at this present moment in time, I have to say. But, um, you know, I think one has to have faith in, in the local parties and, and hope that they also feel a little uneasy uh, at, at the number of women that we have selected at the moment. And that unease will translate itself into some kind of, of action and support of women. So it seems that one of the most contentious issues to grip the delegates here this week was the emergency motion that was never heard, the potential debate that didn't happen. The party leadership say they've bowed to the grassroots and clearly the proposal was a step further than the party was willing to go. But for ambitious Lib Dem women, it's still a long and winding road to the Scottish Parliament and it seems the planned fast track has been brought to a halt by the party's fundamental belief in local democracy. If there is one constituent group the party is determined to attract, it's the business community. With large firms like BT and Scottish Gas taking stalls at the conference, there's an acceptance throughout industry the party is likely to play an influential role in Edinburgh. Craig Wilson reports. Empty blue seats, lots of them. That was the recurring image of the first day of the conference as delegates trickled into Eden Court. Indeed, so sparse was the attendance the opening motion was moved to the cosier surroundings of the theatre's boardroom. But the first day was also corporate day, the day the party began an attempt to cosy up to business, big and small. As part of that attempt, the party launched a new business relations group and a business consultation survey, which will be sent out to 5,000 Scots companies. Listening and consulting are the watchwords. If we don't have a healthy economy, if we don't have new businesses springing up, if we don't have the businesses that are already here flourishing, and of course inward investment, which is very important, if all of those things are not there, then the other good things that we all want to do for Scotland, infrastructure, health, education, cannot follow. No money, no deal. Listening was what Michael Moore, the party's industry and employment spokesman, had to do when he met with representatives of the Scottish Federation of Small Businesses. A former accountant turned politician, a combination he admitted was probably a businessman's worst nightmare, he heard of the plight of one Sky business owner. For instance, milk, you know, people think that you're selling milk really expensive. They don't realise that you are buying it far, far dearer than what the co-op is selling to the, the punter at. Uh, so the differences are colossal. Um, I think in a few years there'll be no small shops left at all. Those kind of concerns are all too familiar for the small business community, which in the run-up to the Scottish parliamentary elections is raising its voice with all the political parties. Well, the unknown always causes business concern because the simple reason it gives us great difficulty in trying to plan. That's not just planning our businesses, that's employment, it's the, the economy. So yes, this is causing us concern. But on the other hand, yes, there is pluses. And I think that uh, it's the old saying, you know, as far as the small firm sector is concerned, they will always see the benefits. They will be in there and fighting for those benefits. So yes, there's reluctance, but yes, there's opportunities. What the Lib Dems can do for them is the key. The party insist they are not there to meddle with the prospect of a key influential role in the decision-making process in Edinburgh, Liberal Democrats say they want to be enablers, helping the business community. I think there's a very much a two-way process going on here with the prospect of a Scottish Parliament and perhaps a strong role for the Scottish Liberal Democrats within that. I'm encouraged that businesses do want to speak to us, but it is very much the case that the Scottish Liberal Democrats want to talk to business because being ignorant about policy is one of the worst crimes a politician can commit and so by talking we hope to improve everybody's understanding. As the Scottish leader toured the stalls of pressure groups and big business, the party were firm in their belief that they are heralding a new chapter in their relations with Scottish firms. Whether that's a chapter that has a happy ending, however, 
won't be known for some time yet. Conference discussions ranged widely across the spectrum of political issues. Tourism, community care, nuclear power, land and planning, wildlife and training. But the motion which attracted the most attention and probably created the greatest contention was on denominational education. Edinburgh South constituency were asking the party to confirm its commitment to non-denominational schools and to resist any further introduction of such education. In an amendment, Paisley South wanted Catholic schools to be left alone. Of course it's essential that religious education is done in school, but not religious instruction. It's essential that we all know about the different religions of the world. It's essential that we all understand why different people have different beliefs. But there should not be instruction in any particular belief within the education system. That should be done in the particular religious institutions. Clearly, everybody must be given the opportunity to attend their own church, mosque, synagogue, Buddhist temple, whatever. I want there to be no doubt in the minds of anyone out there that the Liberal Democrats recognise the right of Catholic schools to exist until such time as parental choice makes a separate system untenable. On the financial argument, which is very often thrown up, the fact that Glasgow has got itself into a, a muddle because it wasn't prepared politically to plan for falling school rolls 25 or 30 years ago is no reason to suggest that some, somehow all our problems would be solved without Catholic schools. And I assure you, people say that. This is infantile nonsense. The reality is that any attempt at present to get rid of the Roman Catholic education system to revise radically the 1918 Act would be bitterly opposed by the Catholic hierarchy and would certainly involve an enormous stushy in the new Scottish Parliament. Uh, does anyone really want to take that on at the present time? The reality also, however, is that particularly in places like Edinburgh, a growing number of Catholic parents are turning their backs on the denominational sector and sending their children to non-denominational schools. I think that it is important that the party sticks to its present policy and accepts the reality that <clears throat> while it may wish to progress in the, in the direction indicated in the motion, the uh, it is not really feasible for the reasons Willis Pickard was setting out in a democracy like ours to force a whole lot of people to give up uh, a, a right they have had for some time. So I think progress has to be by persuasion and consensus and agreement. Conference agreed with Donald Gorry and decided to stay with the policy status quo, denominational schools to be phased out eventually. Defection is a word usually used in the shady world of international espionage, but political defection is proving popular at the moment, and at Inverness, the Liberal Democrats paraded their latest converts, Anna McCarley, Keith Rathen and Arthur and Susan Bell, all former Conservatives, dipped their toes in the water as born-again Liberal Democrats. So what did the Bells hope to achieve by such a dramatic switch in sides? Five months ago, Susan and Arthur Bell were high-profile members of the Conservative left wing. This weekend, they were the darlings of the Liberal Democrats, along with fellow Tory convert Anna McCurley, introduced to conference by Jim Wallace to a rousing reception. They say changing their political hue from blue to yellow has reinvigorated their political lives. Arthur Bell addressing conference in the debate on wealth creation. You will understand that I have never attended a meeting of a, a particular organization I'm about to name called Alcoholics Anonymous, but I believe that at the beginning of one of their meetings, you stand up, you give your name, and you state your condition. My name's Arthur Bell. I used to be a Tory. <laughs> Describing the conference with a dig at former colleagues as the first they've attended in years where having a bus pass wasn't a prerequisite for entry, they insist they have no regrets about changing sides. 
There are many younger people here, there is a broader spread of opinion, and there appears to be a good sense of debate and involvement. The Tories tended to come along to be told what to think by government ministers, so there's a big change. There are a lot of exciting debates going on here, where real, perhaps sometimes uncomfortable issues are actually addressed, and the conflicts pertaining within these issues are aired as well, because you don't reach a good solution unless you know the pros and the cons of all the arguments. It's a hell of a conflict. It's full of activists rather than observers. How do you feel this, this overall attitude differs from the attitudes that, that ultimately force you to leave the Conservative Party? It's a more lively atmosphere altogether. Um, Conservative Party, big machinery of government, uh, answers come from the top down, you hear to hear. Um, motions, you know, it wasn't unusual to get uh, the chairman saying, is there anyone against, at the end of a, a resolution. Uh, they were too simple. Here they're very complicated. They are dealing with the issues that matter to people. What do you think people in, in the kind of position where you were a very high-profile member of the Conservative Party achieve by coming to join a party like the Liberal Democrats? Well, I think it's... Um, somebody said to me it's a very brave move, and I said, no, it's a move that uh, hundreds of thousands of voters have already made. Um, what I want to see is a strong free enterprise party within the Scottish Parliament, and I reckon that the Tories were not going to be that party because of their attitudes towards Scotland and towards Europe. They had written off any credibility that they had with the Scottish electors, and there is this whole new ball game opening up very democratic uh, ball game too uh, and I believe that the Lib Dems have actually got a very strong role to play within that so although the Tories may have been in power for 18 years they were always the opposition in Scotland during my active political lifetime so there's nothing new in that but what is new is that I'm playing a role in albeit a small party that is growing and growing very fast uh, that is coming up towards a new parliament that could end up by playing a very major role. Finally, the conference could be described as transitional, coming between last year's general election and referendum and next year's Scottish, local council and European elections. But transition or not, leader Jim Wallace still had to try to maintain the momentum gained by the party's electoral performance last May. As Craig Wilson discovered, he was upbeat, despite a conference some observers have dismissed as lacking true passion. Rousing wouldn't be the right word to describe the weekend the Liberal Democrats have had, though Jim Wallace tried his best to put his troops in fighting spirit when he delivered his keynote speech. If the art of political conferencing is to get through them without dropping any clangers which give the media and opponents an opportunity to capitalise, however, then it was an unfortunate few days. Rebuttal of plans for gender balance and a sparsely populated hall on day one were hardly PR victories and the leader conceded they would have to look again at their opening day plans. It's a disappointment. I think we're going to have to look again at how we structure our conference timetable. I mean, I think if you're realistic about it, if you look at our, the sort of profile of our conference delegates, most of them are working, difficult to take time off work. They took an awful lot of time off work last year to fight elections. They know they're going to have to do the same again next year. Uh, and I think we've got to perhaps recognise that and also you know, just rejig the timetable of the conference to take account of that. Alan Beath tried his best but with the greatest will in the world, he's no Paddy Ashdown. The national leader spent the weekend contributing to a conference on Bosnia, rather than joining his Scottish counterparts in the Highland capital. But Wallace disputed any claim that this was a snub to the party north of the border. This was something which I think the only people who ever raised it with me uh, were, were journalists. Uh, ordinary conference delegates didn't raise it. They know, they, they, they know too that Paddy's a good friend of the Scottish party. He doesn't need a party conference to come. He was up in Scotland last month consulting with, uh, with, with, with party members on, on policy matters. He'll be back many times between now and the Scottish election. In fact, this time next year we're getting a double bonus because the party's federal spring conference, uh, the whole UK party conference in the spring, will be in Edinburgh. Uh, and then we're going to have our Scottish conference as well and Paddy will be at both. For the first time since the 1920s, there's a recognition that by next year, the Liberal Democrats may have people in power in Scotland. The prospect of a hung Scottish Parliament because of proportional representation is a real one, and Jim Wallace could well find himself kingmaker in any coalition. The party insists they're keeping their options open on who they're likely to coalesce with, despite suspicion their only likely partners are Labour.
it's not so much who would you want to do a deal with, far more important than that is what are the sort of things you want to make this Parliament achieve for Scotland. We're going to say what we want to do. We are strong in our convictions. Uh, we, you know, we, we've not had to reinvent our party uh, as, as the Labour Party has done. We're more than a one-issue party, which the SNP are. And therefore, I think we can go into any negotiations or cooperation uh, in a Scottish Parliament you know, firm in our convictions and arguing that the more Liberal Democrats there are in that Parliament, the more likely we are to get our agenda accepted. The Liberal Democrats believe there are now no no-go areas for their party. Every vote, wherever it comes from, will count under the new electoral system. They make great play of their claim to be the official opposition in Scotland. But on May the 7th next year, there's little doubt among the faithful. They'll be far more than that. And that's all from this year's Liberal Democrat gathering in Inverness. From Conference Report, goodbye.